Welcome to another update. In this one, I'll be covering the latest developments from the front line. Starting out in the Zaporizhia front, we see here that, ha that there has been a significant number of developments. Starting out in the northeast by the Vremilsky Ledge and the Vilikinovasilka area, we see here that there's been a lot of fighting and most of it has been focused around Staromayos. In connection with this, there is a bunch of lost equipment and as we see two British Mastiff PPVs and a Turkish Kirpi being lost. These are armored personnel carriers and we see that the losses here are centered around the roads by the forest lines. So we see that most of the fighting is actually artillery shelling happening by these forest lines. So there's a lot of these by this front line. So generally we see that the main advancement is not coming from the northern parts by Makaevka, but actually from the western parts here uh, northwest of Sermayoska and possibly even deeper going in to flank the Russian positions. I'm not exactly sure where this location is as it hasn't been geolocated. And uh, there is a lot of uh, forest lines as we have seen, so it is difficult to geolocate it. But it is most likely here in the northwestern parts of the village rather than in the northern parts. Other than that, fighting also continues in the direction of Orihiv as the Ukrainian forces continue their attempts at advancing. In connection with this, there is this video here that showcases some uh, burning vehicles. We can see a lot of smoke rising, but more interesting, there is a lot of holes on the ground. This is all from artillery shelling mines and so on. And we can see with this many uh, destroyed mines, artillery shells and so on, there is a lot of losses connected with that. And that collaborates on the previous video where we saw uh, the New York Times article on 30% losses for the Ukrainian offensive power throughout this offensive so far. But it's something else to see it firsthand through the destruction on the fields and all of the black burn marks. But this also shows that some of the vehicles are being recovered by either side, as there is a lot of burn marks, but not that many vehicles left in these areas. Moving on, fighting also continues by the village of Yadhatki and Serbyanki, as the Ukrainian forces continue their efforts at capturing the surrounding areas of Serbyanki and then entering the village itself. But so far, this has reached a stalemate since the 4th of July. Since then, there hasn't been any advances on the Ukrainian side or on the Russian side on this part of the front line. Moving on to the Bakhmut front, we see here that the Ukrainian forces continue fighting here to the north of Shishivka. According to the latest reports, the fighting continues heavily and there's a dispute over the area surrounding the village. How exactly much there is a dispute over, I'm not really sure. Some claims something completely different than others claim. But generally, the most reliable sources are fairly silent on this, most likely because they don't know themselves. So this indicates that there's a lot of volatility on this front line, which means that uh, the areas could change hands multiple times a day, uh, similar to the last days of Bakhmut, where similar things were happening. A lot of the advances were happening on both sides and the areas were changing hands both sides every day. So generally, there is a lot of developments here, but we will see the outcome at the end of it. And then we will see what is actually happening and what has happened. But generally, there's a lot of fighting here, and it seems that the main Russian force fighting in this part are the Chechen forces, while the Ukrainian forces are using multiple diff different brigades, so there's no one specific uh, force here. But they are using a lot of artillery, according to Russian sources, and according to the video evidence we've seen so far from this part of the front line, the Ukrainian forces are not holding back with their artillery expenditure. They are launching a lot of artillery shells, especially here by the trench network, as they try to capture the area. And this shows something else than what we've seen a lot so far. And that is that the Ukrainian forces have a lot of artillery in this part of the front line, which means that they are focusing a lot of it here, which means that they find it as very important. And as I've said multiple times, Klishivka is the most important village on the southern flank of Bakhmut. So most likely they're focusing all of their efforts here to take control over the village. And likewise, the Russian forces continuously send reinforcements to the spot of the front line as they want to hold it on to it at all costs. That brings us to the question, how much artillery shells do the Ukrainians have? and how long will they have it for? And for to answer that question, we have this article here. Europe is pledging Ukraine weapons it can't make. 
and through this article we essentially see so essentially what this article dated to 14th of july is saying is that essentially both the us and europe are uh, depleted of ammunition however the us is still in a much better place in europe that means that despite us being depleted of most munitions the Europeans are much worse off. And the main reason for that is that the production of artillery shells and general munitions in Europe is much worse than that of the United States. It also mentions that a lot of the natural resources necessary for the production that they buy from abroad have significantly risen in price as the whole world sees that the West is trying to build a lot more weapons and a lot more munitions and so on, which allows them to raise the prices astronomically to make a lot of money from this as the West are essentially promised or uh, pledged to give this uh, to Ukraine. They need to build it and, the, and with that comes at the cost of what it comes at and it is a lot. And the investment that needs to go into this is a lot as well as uh, I've mentioned this example before, but essentially Rheinmetall responded to a German government request of uh, increasing the production of artillery munitions. And to that they responded, uh, if you want us to create a new factory or develop our factories, uh, you need to draw a 10 year long contract with us so that we uh, the Rhine metal industry knows that they will profit from it, not that they will take a loss from it. And therefore, they are waiting for the German government to draw up this contract uh, so that the Rhine metal are essentially guaranteed to uh, profit from this. Meanwhile, as this uh, article mentions, the political will is absent in Germany. They do not want to do this as it is very expensive and to little benefit of Germany politically. We also see that generally the whole situation around this is that the Western production is not up to the level that is needed for Ukraine to continue this war. And the, as mentioned in this article, the political will is missing to develop the production is just missing that they aren't willing to do it. So there's no political will to live up to the high costs that is necessary to provides Ukraine with what it needs. So essentially what we learned from this article is that the Ukrainians are constantly complaining that they have less ammunition than the Russians, yet the West is not capable of sending them enough to match the Russians. So this is not an issue that will be fixed, it's an issue that cannot be fixed unless there is political will in Western countries to up their production, to develop their production to the point at which they can match the uh, Russian output and the, the Russian use of artillery in the war. You may argue, well, the Ukrainians have precision guided, the GPS guided uh, artillery that is very accurate in comparison to the Russian artillery, which is a slightly less accurate, but still this accuracy matters. That moves on to this other article also on the 14th of July by The Economist. When GPS fails, how can weapons find their targets? It essentially talks about how the Russian electronic warfare jams the precision guided artilleries, the GPS guided artilleries, and essentially it, it fails. It, it, doesn't, it isn't GPS guided anymore because of the jamming. So with this electronic warfare, this essentially evens out or even gives the benefit to the Russians when it comes to precision, because without the GPS guided, it is essentially just another artillery piece. So with that, the whole situation changes completely because the Russians are able to electronically jam the Ukrainian GPS guided artillery launches. And moving back to the front line, we see here in the Bakhmut area, especially to the south of Berhivka, we see here that there are some developments when it comes to the Russians pushing back the Ukrainians from the settlement. Here we see that there is a, a video of uh, the Ukrainian forces being hit by shells and the aftermath of such as we see uh, the Berhivka Reservoir here to the northwest 
and the equipment as well as uh, Russian soldiers moving around it as we see that they have destroyed this equipment and are checking it out. Moving on according to the deep state map there was also a lot of shelling here to the southwest of the city on the Ukrainian positions by the Dakar area here to the southwest of the city and we see it, it was geolocated by deep state map and uh, that is generally the situation here. There is some Ukrainian positions within the Dacha area, however the Russians are constantly shelling their positions. Finally, moving on to the Luhansk border, we see here that the Russian forces continue their attacks in the Serebryansky forest area to the south of Kremina, and fighting also continues in the outskirts of Torsky to the northeast of the village. So generally the fighting continues heavily here in this part of the front line as well but here the russians are the ones who are on the offensive as they try to slowly advance through uh, these parts of the front line and they are attempting to uh, take control over the ukrainian positions and cover their uh, fortifications and reach uh, the village of Tvorsky and possibly even further then we move on to something that happened in the Crimea area and that is another attack on the Kerch Bridge between Crimea and the Russian mainland. We see here that there is a lot of pictures and videos of the incident, not the incident itself but the aftermath of it. And from these we see these three pictures here which showcase the destruction by the bridge. However, we can say that there is both a success and a failure to the Ukrainian forces through this attack. The success is that they actually managed to hit the bridge and that they were able to uh, stop parts of the movements back and forth. So far the movement has been completely uh, pulled, pushed off. However, this seems through these pictures and this video that the one part is com essentially completely unharmed while the second part is uh, completely blocked so they should still be able to uh, be used one of them to go back and forth while the second one is essentially completely off limits but the most important part is the transport of supplies from russia to crimea and that is mainly through trains and from that we can see that the train area is completely unharmed and it also is continuing as we speak so there's been no harm to the supply through and from russia to crimea the only issue that was hit was the bridge itself for uh, the cars and trucks and so on as for how this happened there is a lot of uh, suggestions not a lot of evidence but the main one is that yesterday, last night, there were a lot of shooting against a jet boat, uh, which was destroyed uh, last night. And the uh, Russian forces claim that there was a lot of explosives on that uh, jet ski. So this means that there could possibly have been others throughout the night and one of them must have reached the bridge, which then allowed the Ukrainian forces to blow up parts of it. So essentially there's been uh, some sort of attack on the Kerch Bridge and most of it has been stopped because I do not believe that this was the only objective of the Ukrainian forces to only do this much damage. However, one got through and it managed to hit the Kerch Bridge. And that is going to be all for this update. Thank you all for watching and have a great day.